Hello, hello. We're back in England. I'm tired. I haven't shaved. I haven't got my hair cut yet. This is ground zero for being back in England. I arrived back on Sunday um, after flying overnight and then had uni on Monday. Um, it's now Wednesday. I haven't been able to sleep in. I've just been <laughs> going through. So this is going to be a chiller video. I uh, don't expect big energy here. <laughs> so what we're going to do is, um, I mean, it's not technically October yet. We're still in September when this video has gone up, but I know that I'm not going to finish any of the books I'm reading before then. So it's September wrap up time, baby. If you do enjoy, please feel free to like and subscribe. It, it makes my heart sing. I um, Every time I see one, I let out a little yodel um, just for the person that subscribed. So if you want to elicit that from me, you know what to do. And the second thing, of course, is to thank all of my Patreons for being such wonderful human beings. Um, I continue to appreciate every single one of you, um, especially given the break that I've had recently, um, just whilst finishing traveling, coming back, and trying to remain a sentient human being that can bring any kind of entertainment or um, energy to to creating videos. But here we are. When I looked through the books that I read in September, weird, weird list. Um, the most important thing is that there are two books that I have read that will not be in this video, because as always, they're going to be in my reading booktuber's favorite books video. Second thing is, who knows, maybe that series will have to change its name. Reading an author's favourite books, hintedy hint hint possibly coming up. The first book I read this month was a big old surprise. I read Big Little Lies by Leanna Moriarty. Uh, for Leanne Moriarty? I think it's Leanne. I read it for uni. Um, first off, American style uh, mass market paperback. They're ascended. These are goated books. Like, they just feel fantastic. Every book should be released like this. I'm not asking. I'm telling you all. That's how they need to be released. Basically, this book follows three women. Uh, Jane, Madeline, and Celeste. And they are in um, Australia. And it's about them as mothers uh, coming into the school environment as their children go to school for the first time and the politics that are involved with that. It is a satirical um, murder mystery that it has very easy prose to get through, very funny, just snappy, fly through it. Uh, it's, it's a page turner. And underneath that, there is wonderful, wonderful commentary and analysis of abuse, of domestic abuse, domestic violence, really hard hitting stuff. Um, in the end I gave this four stars because whilst I very much enjoyed reading it, uh, I sometimes felt like the really hard hitting material was then undercut by what felt like, like a book. <laughs> so there were some parts which felt so real and then there were some parts that you could tell this is what a book needs to make it interesting and those two things clashed. You would have a very serious change in tone like a, a very serious revelation that is then undercut by, we need to make this book sellable. There's a reason this book has hit such a large audience, if you know what I mean. Uh, so those two things didn't quite gel perfectly for me, but as a fun read, very enjoyable, while stealing and really smashing some heavy things. And do it like Celeste as a character is an amazingly portrayed and really nuanced three-dimensional character and uh, the relationships are very well done so I, I actually really would recommend Big Little Lies. Next up, The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. If you can't tell, uh, there's a lot of uni reads on here. Um, so Big Little Lies was for uni, Merchant of Venice is also for university. Um, this was a very interesting read. I think I gave it three and a half stars, four stars because on the surface it very much seems like an anti-Semitic play um, because the, the idea is that the Virgin of Menace, uh, the Virgin of Menace is also a cool name. 
The Merchant of Venice follows a character that has borrowed money from um, from someone called Shylock. Shylock is a Jewish man and he's described in what can only be described as uh, very, very bad Jewish stereotypes. Um, money hungry, just the the quintessential Jewish stereotype. Now, of course, this is from a period, I believe, remembering back in my head, where Jewish people had been... There were no Jewish people living in the UK, like in, in England. Um, they had been forced out. Uh, and so there's a very interesting dynamic where it seems to subvert, in my opinion, the Jewish stereotype Why? giving the audience what they expect from a Jewish stereotype at the time and then subverting it where Shylock has an incredible speech about the idea of what makes us different. We are one and the same. We both have blood running through our veins and there is nothing different between us and that the actions I take are made because of how you react to me and how you subjugate me. I can only, I I have hardened skin. You have made me into this what I am. And it, it was a fantastic fantastic speech that really changed how I viewed the entire thing because now I view it as it's setting up a stereotype to then challenge the audience to say how do you feel about this what why do you think this is the case uh, and I yeah so I've come round to Merchant of Venice and I actually thought it was very good in the end then we hit an exciting one as part of my Patreon uh, we are doing a buddy read, a series buddy read, and they could, uh, everyone put a vote in for what series that I own they would like me to read, and we read together. Um, and the vote was for the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemison. I've been so excited to read it. I have owned it. It's one of the first fantasy books I bought when I started reading again. I found it in a charity shop, and I, I, I remembered hearing a little whisper on the wind, a little... And I, I, um, it came back to me, so I bought it, but didn't read it. It just sat there because um, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I know that the well, I know that the second person put me off um, because it is um, very different, very much not what you would in ordinarily expect. And uh, I think I put a little bit distance between that. But then um, I don't, I don't see a reason why I didn't pick it up. And I, I, I honestly feel quite bad about that. Like, in my fantasy reading, it's incredibly, like, white man orientated. And I tried to break apart from that um, and, and introduced some um, Asian-inspired fantasy. But other than, say, like, Evan Winter's Rage of Dragons, there is an um, incredible lack of, um, of black voices in my fantasy reading. And so I'm glad that I was able to at least make a beginning on um, fixing that. And as a result, I read the fifth season and it was good. I really know that people love this. I know that people love it so much. Uh, when I gave it four stars, even Liena messaged me and was like, oh, and Liena fucking hates everything. So if, if she enjoyed it, then I really should have loved it. Um, but yeah, what we're going to see here is, is that I can't really go into why I didn't like it without spoilers. So I'm not going to go into it um, purely because I like to keep all of these spoiler free. So fifth seasons are where these horrible, these these awful natural disasters occur. So um, a, a volcano eruption, a, a hurricane, a tornado, the, the, the land is obliterated during these periods um, and they happen however many years um, and human beings just try to survive the brunt force of it. And so we are following um, as these events are occurring, as a fifth season is around. I don't know how to describe it uh, exactly. You'll understand when you read it. There is uh, also the concept of originy, which is um, the, the, yeah, the, the magic system in this world. Um, I'm not exactly going to go into that either, because I do believe that that is a very interesting uh, subject to discover with the characters. Um, but what happens is you're following a character called Demaya who is discovering her abilities in, uh, in Origeny and her um, journey from being given away by her parents to what happens. 
Uh, we're also fill, uh, following Essen, who is, as I said, the second person character um, that, that that is you during the book is that Essen, as she is traveling to find um, her husband and child. Finally, Cyanite. Cyanite is um, a character who has the abilities of Orogeny and has been told by the people in charge to travel to visit um, someone who has 10 rings of power. So it's the idea that she has four. Um, so she is a, a kind of, well, a four out of 10 level uh, in Orogeny and she's been traveled, she's been told to go visit the person with 10 and to have a child with him. And it's about their relationship um, as they progress as well. And then of course, these events culminate um, and I will say that the culmination of this story completely justified and made the second person a brilliant choice. Um, once again, I will say there is something that happens that I, I realised about halfway through that was going to be the twist. Um, and one thing about the narrative framing of that is what made the book only a four star for me, not a five star, because I think it took the tension out for me for some of the characters. Um, make of that what you will. People love this. Then I read Measure for Measure. Uh, I mean, it was also good. I, I really, I, I'm studying these, you know. I, I, I won't lie to you, can't be bothered to talk about it. So I read Measure for Measure by Shakespeare. Uh, it was also good. I gave it 3.5 stars. Move on with that day. Then I read one of the books that I can't talk about because it's for a reading booktuber's favourite books. And then we hit an absolute heartbreaker in Beloved. Uh, Beloved by Toni Morrison was phenomenal. I gave it five stars. I described it as truly haunting and brilliant. It is amazing. Um, this is a set during post-abolishment of slavery in America. Um, and we are following Setha. We're following Setha, um, who owns a house with her daughter, Denver. Um, and this is a classic Toni Morrison book in that it switches between um, time constantly. We are flipping between time periods, uh, from going from the present to the past to just everywhere. And sometimes I will admit it was hard to track where we were early on, uh, but then that becomes part of the satisfying conclusion where you're piecing together what actually happened. Um, and so the idea is that Setha has four children. She only now lives with one. Her eldest daughter died. When the burial takes place, uh, the only thing that she can afford to put on the tombstone is Beloved. She can't put Dearly Beloved, um, she can just put Beloved. And then in the present of the book that we're reading, um, a woman arrives and is at the house that is roughly the same age as her child if it had lived and calls herself Beloved. And so it is a um, quasi-spiritually ghost novel. Um, it is inspired by folk and ghost tales. It is inspired by a lot of actual stories in slavery and it is fucking heartbreaking. It really hurts. It is all about grief and loss and um, confinement, being being free, but what does free mean? If you've been released from slavery, how can you move on? How can that not affect the rest of your life? Can you truly be free if you're basically in the same circumstance? Um, you don't have any money, you are released with nothing. How can you truly be free in that situation? So Baby's eight children had six fathers. What she called the nastiness of the life was the shock she received upon learning that nobody stopped playing checkers just because the pieces included her children. Hallie, she was able to keep the longest, 20 years, a lifetime, given to her, no doubt, to make up for hearing that her two girls, neither of whom had their adult teeth, were sold and gone, and she had not been able to wave goodbye to make up for coupling with a straw boss for four months in exchange for keeping her third child, a boy, with her, only to have him traded for lumber in the spring of the next year and to find herself pregnant by the man who promised not to and did. That child she could not love and the rest she would not. God take what he would, she said, and he did, and he did, and he did, and then gave her Hallie, who gave her her freedom when it didn't mean a thing. And that... Yeah, absolute goosebumps. It is a beautiful excerpt. 
in the fact that it's fucking heartbreaking. And that perfectly sums up what this book is about. Who gave her her freedom when it didn't mean a thing. And uh, yeah, Toni Morrison, incredible. Okay, I don't know where this book is in my house, so I can't be bothered. Uh, Night Watch by Terry Pratchett. We, me and Grace, continued our buddy read of the City Watch series. Um, so as a result, we've reached the sixth book in the series with two more left. So Night Watch uh, is brilliant. It's one of the best Discworld books easily. Um, I find it hard to rank. It's, it's impossible. Um, the first three and Night Watch going postal, they are all in my favourites. This is the best examination of Vimes that I think you could ever do. This is a Vimes masterclass. We are deep diving on that character. We are seeing all the progression that he's gone through before this. We are seeing all the progression that he still has left to do. We are immersed in Vimes in this book and it's done to a phenomenal level, making him one of the best characters that I've ever read. Um, he is so deeply, deeply flawed and so deeply, deeply positive in how I view that it, you not, you're not always going to be the best person. You are never going to be always good, but the best you can do is always try to be better. And Vimes is that. He is the quintessential, just keep trying. Just keep trying to learn and be better. And eventually, you will be. And uh, I don't want to go into it because it's the sixth book in a series. But that's it. It's so funny, as always. One of the funniest Discworld books, actually. Um, it deals with Alan's favourite subject in Revolution. It, it was brilliant. Um, Nightwatch, Terry Pratchett. Forever. Then I read another book that I can't talk about because it was uh, for another video. We're down to the final two. The final one I own uh, physically is The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey. I don't know whether that's how you pronounce Roffey. Roffey? Roffey. Nevertheless, I have been wanting to read this for a long time, ever since I was recommended it by my lecturer. And then Grace was kind enough to buy it for me. And so uh, I fucking read it. Who would have thought it? Someone buys you a book, I read it. So this takes place in 1976 um, in a village called St. Constance on an island called Black Conch. And so we are following the perspective of our main character, David, who um, sits down on, on the coast with his guitar, smoking his reefer, and plays his, like, just plays his guitar out. And what happens is the vibrations attract um, a mermaid. And mermaids are unheard of in this place. Mermen are people quite often think that they've seen or heard or know about mermen. Mermaids, on the other hand, aren't known. And so we then switch perspective to um, a group of white men. No, well, a father and son who are white, who are going out with a local crew um, to take part in the fish, local fishing competition that happens. Um, so all of these people from all the different Caribbean islands, from South America, from the, like, I think it's like Portugal and that as well, they all come um, and take part in this fishing competition. The mermaid, hearing the, like, feeling the vibrations, assumes that he's playing his guitar, that David's playing his guitar, and instead is caught by these white men. And they automatically believe that they own her as they've caught her. There's some really um, interesting work done around the idea of not 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 sexual domination even for some characters, but um, like gender domination. Sexual domination feels too base in a sense that um, there are characters that do think about raping her, and and uh, I don't want to get into it, but there are even some gender domination that occurs. The idea of feeling the need to piss on her and to kind of demonstrate that, that using your penis to, to wash this creature. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna get into that further, but this kind of happens. So um, they string her up and they leave her out overnight. They all get drunk. David cuts her down, takes her away. And that is the story from there. Um, it is their relationship as they start to get to know each other, um, the, the hunt for the mermaid, etc. It was fantastic. I gave it nine out of 10, I believe. I gave it four and a half stars. Um, the book does a fantastic illustration of intersectionality. 
uh, in the sense of intersectionality. Uh, luckily enough, I just started, I, I knew of intersectionality, but I've just started learning at university. So it's really handy to pick up the first book after learning about it, and it's all about intersectionality. So it's the idea of, um, say for example, not being discriminated against on the fact that you are black or not being discriminated on the fact that you are a woman, but being discriminated for the fact that you are a black woman. Um, these kind of crossroads that take place where it's two roads of problems that you won't necessarily be judged for individually, but when you are in that middle of crossing both of them, that's where it takes place. So what we see here is very interesting in the sense of how race and gender comes into play, um, both of them individually, uh, race and disability, how they come into play together, um, the othering involved, of course, of having a mermaid, etc., etc. Brilliant, brilliant, thematic work, brilliant storytelling, so I would really recommend The Mermaid of Black Conch. And then finally, I joined a bandwagon. Ugh. I read I'm Glad My Mum Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Um, I listened to it through Audible uh, because I don't want to pay the price for a new book and I had a spare uh, credit sat there and I've been really wanting to read it, so that was it. It's read by Jeanette McCurdy as well, which is always a massive plus. I think that's what I'm going to do now. Um, I'm going to listen to biographies, autobiographies, etc., um, using Audible, that's how I'm going to use that medium. I'm Glad My Mum Died was very hard to read. It was a very tough read. If you have any trigger warnings in terms of abuse, child abuse, um, specifically involving eating disorders, be very careful. Um, as someone who, as someone who um, did used to make themselves sick, uh, it's fucking rough to read. Um, I, I did mine from a place of anxiety. I used to have very bad anxiety around exams. And so every exam season, every morning, I would wake up, brush my teeth, be sick, brush my teeth, and then go to school. That was just how I worked. Um, that was how it worked for that entire period. I was a fucking mess. Um, and that's why I don't do exams anymore. Don't worry, it's not a problem. It has been a problem for probably like fucking six, seven years now. But... It's tough to read, tough to hear, and um, be prepared. But it is fantastically structured, really fast-paced. It's kind of like short vignettes. Like, every chapter is just super quick, just cutting through, getting the point across, told very bluntly. Um, fantastic, fantastic display and reflection. Um, and, I mean... As someone, as someone who always loved iCarly, I was such a big iCarly kid, and I'm glad that Jeanette McCurdy will no longer be famous for playing Sam Puckett. Jeanette McCurdy will now be famous as writing one of the best memoirs to come out in however many years. Um, and I only wish her the best in her recovery. I just wish that... She continues on what evidently I hope is a good path and can continue to progress. Um, I'd be so interested in reading a fiction book written by her. As always, if you did like, please do like, please do subscribe. I apologise for the absolute lack of fantasy. What did I read? Two fantasy books in a whole month. And they're both pretty short. I have been lacking on them because I have had so much other shit to read. Love you all. Thank you to my Patreons once again. If you want to join the Discord, feel free. Uh, we love to have chats over there. And as always, have a nice rest of your day.